and it, it is it seems to be working so great so three two one and uh, we're live on the metabolic motivation show and uh, very happy to have dr. Deborah Gordon on uh, she is uh, someone who's been practicing medicine for a long time and has a very interesting uh, sort of holistic approach uh, dr. Gordon welcome and uh, how are you today I'm doing just fine today thanks for asking and I'm happy to be here fantastic Fantastic. Well, I know one of your, your big topics, um, uh, just, you've got a wonderful website, by the way, uh, and uh, a lot of wonderful free information that people can, uh, can partake of. Um, but uh, before we get into that, let's t- can you give us your backstory briefly? How did you uh, go from being a traditional MD to, being, um, you know, to, to evolving into your, pr- your practice today? I think it was more how did I go from being the California hippie radical that I was to going to conventional medical school for a while (laughs) and then find myself again. (laughs) You know, I loved medical school. It was uh, inspiring and challenging and there were great people there. But as I finished my family practice medical residency, I thought, oh, wait a minute. What did I do this for? (laughs) And I began and I. And I actually looked all the way through medical school for help with the field of preventive medicine, which I knew is what I was interested in. I knew from the get-go that the way conventional medical medicine is practiced was not of interest to me and not of great value to a lot of people, not of primary value. I was unsuccessful at finding much about preventive medicine. Uh, The only work we did on nutrition was some side work I did on the side, working with a nutrition group with Marion Nessel, who was at our medical school. Other than that, oh, no, vitamins were mentioned once when I was in medical school. One mention of vitamins. One mention of vitamins. I was on a special surgical service called the Blood and Pus Team, where we dealt with Uh, infections and extremities and only in that situation did doctors put their patients on vitamins at all in the whole time well I I guess alcoholics always got B vitamins but you know just sort of general regular people with a medical problem that was a vitamin so after um, my family practice residency I had some tremendous medical skills from how I was trained but I was always interested in talking to people about the what they ate and how they lived their lives and how much they slept and how well they slept and it's only increasingly so over the last 10 years that there's actually a lot of data and things I can hang my hat on and say no this isn't just my whimsical notion that you should go off gluten this is uh, this is actually established that gluten can cause unexplained dizziness and you ought to give it a try and go off of it Um, so it's really I felt more like it's coming home than I started as a white coat stethoscope MD and and, uh, found this path. Wow. Well, good for you. Good for, you know, I guess it's, I guess it's from my experience, um, unusual to see that, you know, that, uh, that path. Um, Oftentimes, I guess when I see people who are really interested in the preventive side, uh, they oftentimes don't, uh, don't go or not as motivated to go, you know, through the rigors of medical school. So, you know, hats off to you. And uh, <laughs> so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about one of uh, one topic that is fascinating is the topic of food as medicine and, and uh, versus food a, and as, you know, toxicity. Mm-hmm. I, I uh, that's, always been an interest you know uh, I think when I was a teenager Adele Davis was kind of all we had yes. um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and I'd say about maybe 15 years ago so I think I was always interested in people eating what they what was considered to be a healthy diet the problem was that what was considered a healthy diet 15 or 20 years ago was difficult for me to grasp because while I continued to, I mean, I always ate butter and I always ate full fat everything. It, I tried that low fat intervention with people who had high cholesterol or had high blood pressure. And did you, are you surprised? It always failed. Yes. Yeah. I saw it myself hundreds of times. And you know what we used to say? And uh, I guess it's every, we were always told, well, you know, people are just not following the program. <laughs> so That's right. <laughs> you know, they, they must be cheating. Right, and you know that's actually the rationale now. When you think about when someone, 
when somebody concedes that either the paleo diet or a Weston Price diet or a ketogenic diet might be applicable in some circumstances, they always have the caveat, oh, but nobody would ever really go to the extremes of eating that way. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you saw my recent uh, letter to the editor in The New Yorker, but uh, they had a wonderful article on gluten, and it was actually very balanced, even though, as I p pointed out, the guy who wrote the article keeps a sourdough starter as a pet. This right. is how much he loves his bread. But it was a really good article on gluten. And I de what I wanted to get in there was something, I wanted to write a letter that said, because they, he interviewed several doctors who said, I see a benefit to my patients from going off gluten, but that's too hard. Who would ever do that? Nobody would ever do that who was not in their right, you know, in their right mind. So um, I wrote a letter praising their article, which I thought was good, pointing out the work of at least Dr. Alessio Fasano, who they hadn't, he hadn't interviewed, and then saying that I myself as a physician avoid bread, and I think my diet is totally diverse, delicious, and complex, and I, I've never looked back once I've given up grains and gluten. Oh, wonderful. I'm, that's, I'm sure that article is, must be online now. That's in the, in the New Yorker, right? Right. My letter was in the de December 1st issue, and the, it was early November that the article was about gluten, and that was good. And, and I think gluten is just a, <clears throat> is the perfect example, <clears throat> excuse me, but maybe a little bit too notorious. Um, you know, I have a, uh, a strong uh, appreciation, participation, and loyalty to the Weston Price Foundation. I think they've made a huge understanding in all of our, uh, a huge impact and contribution to all of our understanding about what makes excellent food and how it should be prepared. Yes. And um, they... I, I can certainly, on certain days, when I see a lot of people with skin problems and various complex problems, I can be on a roll where just absolutely everybody should be off gluten. And, uh, you know, certainly Dr. William Davis of Heart, you know, heart Health, uh, Belly. Mm. Wheat Belly. Wheat Belly, Wheat. Total Health. Have you read his new book? You know, I have not. I'm, I'm looking very, forward to, to getting yeah. it and, and speaking with him in the future. Right, he spreads it out to more grains than just gluten very elegantly. And so I certainly go through days where I think, you know, we just, it's time for us to be living our lives mostly without grains and certainly almost entirely without gluten. But then there are people who tolerate it very well, and particularly if it's really wisely prepared. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, it. You're in Europe now, is that right? I am. I'm in, in southern Europe. Yes. So, you know... It, in Europe, the, uh, there was actually a study where they took some celiac patients, not just gluten-sensitive patients. I'm gluten-sensitive, but I don't have celiac at all. Um, and gave them you know, bread from the United States versus bread from Europe. And, and they actually could tolerate the sourdough, homemade, locally grown, non-glyphosate sprayed wheat that produced what is known as bread in Europe. What's been your experience? Well, you know, I I have definitely noticed that um, the the bread in the states. I've been I've been off of gluten gluten and and grains in pretty much for about two years now, and uh, uh, so I did notice I just liked the bread better in Europe, and uh, <laughs> that was the main thing. And uh, so uh, I didn't really notice. I, I never, you know, I I kind of had gone restrictive a bit because I had some indications of pre-diabetes back in, back in university over 20 years ago. And uh, so I decided, you know, of all the things uh, that I could eat, if I want to cut back on, you know, cut back, I'll just cut back on the bread and, and go with, you know, other, other types of, uh, of carbs. So, so I was uh -huh. already, I was not really a big bread eater any, uh, as, as much as many people might, might have been, I guess. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, you know, that's just, the perfect example, and that one is fairly uh, predictable across the society. You know that uh, if a patient comes in and does suggest to me that they have numerous autoimmune disease or they have high blood pressure and uh, scary cholesterol to their other doctor, half the time of which I think is glorious cholesterol, but you know some of the time it's actually scary. Gl gluten and grains are things that are fairly generalizable, but then <clears throat> beyond that, it really is an individual uh, looking for what 
what floats your boat and what sinks your boat. Yes. You know, like I, um, I did the, have you ever done the, a ketogenic diet for a while? Yes, yes. So when I did the ketogenic diet, as can happen with many people, my sleep went to, you know, it, it was just, it completely went off. And, and I took away from that, that even when I'm not eating ketogenic, even when I'm just sort of eating and running my life, that I could go a whole day and not particularly have a starchy carb and not think about it. But I'll sleep better if I have some starchy carb at dinner time. So that's just, it has nothing to do with overall health or the carb being good or bad in any particular way. I just know that physiologically how it interacts with my body is that I get a good night's sleep. Right, yes. I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of talk about that, and I've actually sort of practiced that myself. Would that be because of maybe a serotonin, um, you know, uh, some influence on serotonin, perhaps? It certainly could be that, and that could be through a whole complex series of steps. It could just be that it uh, feeds or produces, uh, stimulates um, serotonin production in your brain, but the other thing is that the starchy carbs could feed the good bacteria okay. that stimulate serotonin production in the gut. Yes. We don't know. And then if you read Dave Asprey's work, the man yes. who developed Bulletproof Coffee, his theory is really more that um, your brain is going to prefer to work on sugar substrates during the night when it's doing a lot of its cleaning. And the first thing it will do will be clean out your liver glycogen. And if you don't have a huge store of it, or if you don't pre-feed it with a different alternative sugar-based fuel that you won't get through the whole night of sleep. So that's quite different from just serotonin. It's your liver going around saying, well, there's no more glycogen here. I know if I re release a little adrenaline, a little cortisol comes out into the system, right. that'll raise my blood sugar. So <clears throat> I don't know if it's completely blood sugar dysregulation. I don't get hypoglycemic during the day, but that theory holds just as much interest to me as the serotonin one. Right, yeah, the cortisol would definitely be, uh, be yeah, could, could be something. It's not going to be very conducive to sleep, uh, as we know very well. Well, why don't we change gears just a bit, you know, with that and pivot on cortisol. Um, and I know hormone health and balance is something that you're quite interested in. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about that. Uh, maybe, you know, some of the big, what are some of the big issues you see with regards to, to hormones? I think the biggest issue I see, and it might be a reflection of my patient population. You know, I've been this month, for some reason, I've had numerous patients where we've looked at the chart and I've said, wow, 20 years ago today was your first visit with me. Oh, uh, so wonderful. My, my patients and I are aging together, um, hopefully gracefully, knock on wood. Uh, so uh, I, I have mm, two-thirds, three-quarters an older population, and I'd say the general understanding in the society is that hormone replacement therapy is something that should be used as a last crutch and as minimally as possible. And that's based on the Women's Health International study where they terminated the uh, ho hormonal therapy intervention with women because women were getting an increased incidence of breast cancer. And there were just so many, and that was the takeaway that everybody walked away with when I suggest to them, gee, you're tired, you're not sleeping, your brain doesn't work well, you've lost your sex drive, um, you, you've got discomfort in your vagina. Um, have you thought about hormones? Oh, no, I read that from that study that it causes cancer. And that's just so far afield from bioidentical hormone replacement, which uh, I've been doing for 15 or 20 years, both with myself. Um, my mother died of breast cancer, so I know <clears throat> I'm going to stay on the hormones because I don't want to get breast cancer. Yes. <clears throat> we have a little... <clears throat> weather front going through. I think it's given me a frog in my throat. Uh, so I'm, I love spending time with uh, women and men, and I have more, you know, as every doctor does until they are in critical care, we have more women patients. And then when we're in the emergency room, we have more men patients. Oh, that's, that's so true. See it, see it here as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, just talking to women about that these hormones really can be replaced bioidentically, very safely, and it's, it's a real give and take between the woman, myself, my knowledge, and the lab 
and the pharmacy. You know, the pharmacy has to make them up in a way that they'd be compatible with the woman's own biology, that they really are yes. estradiol and progesterone, you know. Um, and then we, I want her to be happy on the program we're using. I want her blood levels to be pleasing to me. Oh, so that not, you know, they have to be in some good relationship with each other. And then, and then we're getting into the field of, of epigenetics a little bit. I want to look at how her body metabolizes estrogen. Yes. Uh, because there's, you know, the, the liver pathways for metabolizing estrogen are probably some of the ways in which people get into trouble with hormones when those are defective. So we know that if we give women, for instance, postmenopausal women, but we're really jumping right into the meat of this. Yes. If we, if we give them estrogen in an oral form, it goes through their liver, and that at least temporarily does raise the risk of cardiovascular disease. And I think that's just the red flashing light weak point that I pay attention to for every woman, even though I don't usually, I very rarely prescribe oral estrogen. So we do a lot of talking, work out a program the woman likes, and then we do lab tests, sometimes fairly frequently in the first year, and then decreasing so because once they get a steady regimen, they can stay with it. And my recommendation is they stay with it for the rest of their life. I mean, I don't, there are some hormone protocols where they give sufficient hormones so that a woman's period comes back. And I don't go for those kind of levels at all, but still have substantial levels of estrogen and progesterone in the bloodstream. Women definitely feel different while they're taking them. <clears throat> Once they can get over the hump of either their fear of cancer or their reluctance to take a prescription, yes, uh, ninety percent of them are happy with it. Interesting. So, would you? Uh, so, if you if you don't usually use the the uh, what type what form would you normally use? I usually start women with a topical cream. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, because. Uh, it's something that they can vary the dose because the first thing I want is for her to feel good on the regime I'm giving her. So I'll pick a medium strength uh, yes. cream made with the two estrogens, 50-50 estradiol and estriol, and have her find a dose, whether it's a half gram of the cream once a day or a whole gram twice a day, what really gets her feeling optimal. And then I'll rewrite the prescription Either is the cream or it can that same knowledge I acquire from what dose works for her. If she prefers to have it in a vaginal or a sublingual trochee, pellet, liquid, cream for the vagina, what there's lots of different ways to get it. But I always start with the cream for the estrogen. I usually start with a, an oral form of bioidentical progesterone, either compounded or you know, you can get that. That is actually the one it was the first bioidentical hormone that was available through conventional prescription and they did it not because the drug is altered in any way to receive a patent certification but because it's suspended in oil which makes it more easily absorbed wow, so and when women take that at night uh, before bed it it almost always enhances sleep which wow. is usually that's some great information. I've read quite a lot about uh, about hormones in the last year, and that's uh, you've got a lot of great great stuff. Have you? Uh, do you have a book yourself? Uh, I don't yet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I don't. I actually worked with uh, Wiley and Sons about twenty years ago and edited a series of books. One was which was about natural treatment of menopause, and I think after working on that with a, a researcher and then going through menopause, I thought wow, the natural treatment of menopause, doing it with hormone, uh, herbs, I mean, and um, lifestyle things is so complicated and so unpredictable. And I think steps on the same shaky step stones that bioidentical hormone therapy does. It raises some of the same fears in women and I think requires the same kind of modification. Um, uh, I'm sure there are people who are really skilled in managing menopause with black cohosh and black and clover, and uh, I'd rather manage them with bioidentical hormones. <laughs> think about a, think about a book about doing a book. I think your information would be so would be wonderful for a lot of people, a lot of physicians who would probably be interested in maybe you know couldn't find this information uh, so easily. 
especially since you, you know, you practice what you preach. And I do practice that. On that one, I definitely practice what I preach. Yeah. Well, Dr. Gordon, speaking of, speaking of, of, um, of menopause and, and let's, why don't we shift into, if we could, and talk a bit about fertility with, with uh-huh. females, and then maybe we could touch on some male hormonal things if, if we could. It's, uh, and do you have, you know, fertility is a big topic, and there's, a, I'd say, the, the two big topics of being ready to have a baby, and that includes both men and women. You know, uh, I actually, if a woman, if they come to me and say they want to have a baby and they're having trouble, first thing I'd say is, you know, are, are you really healthy enough to have a baby? Have you been taking good care of yourself? Both partners. Yes. Um, ideally for the last six months. And if they haven't, I'd say, well, then we need to find a form of birth control, most of which are not very good, for you to use until you can say you've got six healthy months under your belt. Yes. Uh, And so I have um, actually the diet I recommend on my website for pregnancy is also a good prenatal diet for a woman to be on with very high quality protein with attention to um, really increasing the um, recommendation I have is three a I think it's the same as the perfect health diet uh, Paul Jaminet's recommendation yes. of three, yeah. three egg yolks at least a day um, adequate amounts of wild fish if they have access to it and a really good high quality fish oil fermented cod liver oil if they don't have access to the wild caught fish but most people you can get that you can get that even if you have to buy it online these days right uh, and um, and then avoiding kind of the obvious things of alcohol, drugs, um, things like that leading up to the pregnancy. And obviously during the, I guess, treating yourself in the six months before pregnancy, men and women, as if you're both a pregnant woman. Right. And then once the woman is pregnant, most of the father's job has been done in determining the health of the baby. But... Obviously, the patterns that they set up during the pregnancy, they're going to keep going uh, with once the baby's born. For couples that have trouble getting pregnant, I have, um, I, I also, the, in addition to covering the nutritional basis, is this woman nutritionally competent to be pregnant? Because her body won't let her get pregnant until she does. And so yes. uh, the most widely known nutritional uh, intervention in that area is to put women on full fat dairy, and of course, all my patients are on full fat dairy anyway. But in the conventional literature, right, they see that full fat dairy. Um, I think that's a good place to look at other toxins, what toxins could be coming in, what stresses people have in their environment, and how adequate their hormone cycling is while they're trying to get pregnant. If they've been off and on birth control pills all their life, it could be very hard to get a good cycle going again. Yes. A yes, fertile definitely. cycle. You know, I had um, a question from, from someone um, just a few weeks ago about, it was a, a young woman who was, who was in, uh, hoping, is hoping to get pregnant, and she was, uh, I think it, her, um, she had looked at her hormones with her gynecologist, and her, uh, apparently her progesterone level was a bit lower than they wanted. <clears throat> and uh, so she was asking me about... Um, let me think. What was it? Was an herbal thing that this? I know this may be out of your area, but uh, chase berry, I think. It, right, and a chase berry, uh, <clears throat> otherwise known as Vitex, is Vitex. a good progesterone analog. Um, and I, I, I'm not that familiar with it. I mean, I do know people use it, and they they use it for <clears throat> supplementing that half of the cycle. <clears throat> But because I come from a background where I think bioidentical hormones are actually very safe and they're much more quantifiable. Yes. So I guess if someone said, well, I really wanted to use Vitex, I'd say, okay, take the Vitex and let's measure your progesterone levels. Right. See if it works. Alive, or blood and see if it works for you. Because your baby doesn't care that you have progested, progesterone-like effects in your body. It really needs that you have progesterone. Yes. So if <clears throat> if the Vitex or the Chase tree really does stimulate the production of progesterone, that would be great. You know, when you take phytoestrogens to deal with menopausal symptoms, they work something like estrogens, but they don't raise your estrogen levels, not to the significant degree that hormones do. So I, I'm not sure about 
going over to the progesterone end of things if Vitex or Chase Tree does that. So, uh, yeah, I know there are a lot of women who have had trouble with birth control pills. You, they need to resort, and this would be a last step after waiting good time, de-stressing, cleaning up your diet. They may need to resort to cyclic progesterone to get their cycle going. Yes. And if they're only getting their cycle going with good progesterone, I think it's a very safe hormone, well monitored, to continue, particularly for the first part of pregnancy, because if, if they have a second part of their cycle is progesterone deficient, yes. I, there's a good chance they're going to be progesterone deficient in the first trimester of their pregnancy, too. Right, which could lead to miscarriage uh, risk. Could lead I to guess. miscarriage. Right. And you really only want to, you know, you want a real physiologic miscarriage. When your body says this pregnancy isn't viable, there's something wrong with it, great. That, allow those miscarriages to happen. But you don't want a miscarriage to happen because your progesterone levels are too low. Yes. Yeah, and it's definitely. Definitely. Well, fascinating stuff. Uh, could we shift to maybe in ch to look at um, talk a bit about about the male hormonal issues? What do you see nor uh, as the main hormone problems with men? I think the main hormones with men come into play more with environmental toxins that they may be ingesting or getting through their skin or through their workplace or whatever that are actually tipping their estrogen testosterone balance a little bit so we can actually you know test that uh, blood levels in men to see what their estradiol is and then to try and think about why so if you it, with the low testosterone they can get a lower sperm count and and have less uh, viable active performing sperm so if you and if that low testosterone is associated with a higher estrogen, there's a lot of ways we address the higher estrogen. Get the toxins out of their life. Um, look to see if there's anything, whether it's belly fat um, or something else they're doing that is <clears throat> uh, take <clears throat> taking their testosterone and converting it to estrogen. You know, with an aromatase. So belly fat is a natural aromatase. Um, if they've got you know, man boobs and belly fat, that's going to interfere in the way of their having a healthy testosterone. If they've been around a lot of plastics in their life, you know, they're, um, they're a cyclist and they drink for six hours a day out of little plastic water bottles. Oh, yes. You know, th that can be a, a problem. I, I think more often we find um, that the link is not that clear. You know, people, men I've seen, I, I'd be curious what, what you're seeing with that, because um, I don't see a lot of young men in my practice, but the ones I've seen with sperm problems haven't had higher estrogens. I look for that, but that's not been the explanation. H have you been seeing young well, people with fertility problems? Well, I, I have, yeah, anecdotally more than, more than with my wellness coaching. Um, it's, it's kind of something that uh, people will come to me, and what I find is the prejudice is usually the men tend to think the problem, you know, it's the woman's problem, <laughs> and I guess, you know, maybe you've seen that yourself, and then only after, you know, the woman has done everything, and then they start to realize, and I, I, I usually make a joke about Henry VIII, you know, and uh, how, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the, his wife's problem, you know, fault that they could not conceive a son, a son. you <laughs> right. know, and, uh, and maybe that same thing, you know, that same thing may be happening. And um, so, um, so at that point, you know, then people become more, more interested. And as, as you mentioned earlier, very astutely, women tend, you see the women in the, you know, going to see their doctor regularly and you see the men go more often in only in the ER. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that's, uh, that, that I, that's what I see quite a bit of. But, but as far as uh, when men come to me, I often see um, the symptoms, you know, the low energy, I see uh, the, the belly fat, um, we see the loss of, of, uh, loss of muscle mass, uh, over, even for, for active men who are, you know, going to the gym three, four, five times a week, which, which might be too much, in fact. Uh, <laughs> In fact, so um, that's, yeah, that's what, so I'm definitely am seeing what, seeing more of that, but it's usually not, people are not as, not, not as aware of it. Right. But I, you know, uh, maybe it was more in my generation because people actually had mumps as children that the men were pretty quick to go, you know, if any ch man had ever had mumps, he would be very 
uh, aware that he had to go get a sperm test because he may be shooting blanks. And, and uh, you know, now kids these days, young people these days, and you know, they've had a mumps, most of them have had a mumps vaccine, and so they didn't have mumps itself. Uh, I think the, you know, the declining sperm count can be attributed, we, we're just wandering in the dark when we're dealing with the, the declining sperm count and the obvious uh, problem that we can identify with excess estrogen, both just in your body and from the environment is only part of it. You know, what do electromagnetic fields, how do they affect sperm motility, if not count? Um, what is the stress of our life? How much time do men spend sitting down instead of walking around? You know, excess heat to the testicles sure. greatly impairs their fertility, their ability to uh, generate a pregnancy. Um, hot tubs, uh, bicycling, uh, depending on, I guess, what you wear and what kind of bike you're riding, can be terrible things for uh, the health of sperm. And so that has to be, the whole lifestyle has to be looked at on an individual basis, knowing that a big part of what we're looking for, we have no idea what we're looking for. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. There's, this will be, it'll be really interesting that to, um, you know, in four or five years from now to, uh, to look back and hopefully we'll have, uh, have more answers in, in regards to this. It's, it would help if, if more of the funding, the research funding, was not going to, to the pharmaceutical area and was perhaps looking at other <laughs> lifestyle yeah, interventions. Can, we can only a, hope. <laughs> right, you know, but, you know, the money actually, you know, when you say the money going into pharmaceutical, that is the pharmaceutical company's money. They're paying for their research to hopefully validate their work. The federal money is pretty much dried up. I mean, there's just, I heard a... a estimate yesterday that research scientists now spend 50% of their time on marketing, essentially, on trying to get themselves additional uh, funding. So, so there have been uh, great cutbacks on uh, in the, in what's the NIH uh, yeah, funding and that barely, sort of thing. Barely exists anymore. I think, you know, just a very, very simple lifestyle thing to tell everybody is if your cell phone is within an inch of your body, it should be in airport mode. That's a great, yeah, a great point. So, you know, I mean, men I, putting their, their iPhone in their pocket next to their, you know, crown jewels does not seem like a good idea to me. No, definitely not. Uh, definitely not. In fact, there's a, the name escapes me. There is a uh, professor down at Cal Berkeley who is um, really focused on this area a lot and has a lot of really good, you know, hard hard data on on this whole issue because you still hear the, people out there saying, oh, well, you know, it sound, it's, it's sort of the tobacco industry tactics in a way that, yeah. well, you know, there's no proven, uh, no proven data yet that shows problems or, or the next step is to say um, that, yes, th there might be a problem with the laboratory animals, but only that would be the equivalent of, and they exact, make, create some exagger exaggerated number to, uh, to make the average person think, oh, well, I'm okay. Do you, right. do you notice that? Do you notice that yourself? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, there's two studies recently that, you know, are, are and there's, there are more studies from before, but they're getting to be better and better studies. They, I think this study was from Sweden following back, and it was a retrospective study looking at brain tumors, and definitely the location of the brain tumors correlated with the side of the head on which oh, yes. people talked on their cell phone and then I think it's four cases of women who got breast cancer right under where they would put their cell phone in their bra. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, in fact, I was speaking to a, uh, a physician in Denver um, on an inter with an interview uh, in the last couple of weeks and he mentioned that uh, a colleague or someone he knew, an, a, another physician, uh, you know, when you're on call at night, they, they were accustomed to sleeping with the cell phone under the pillow on all night. And she yeah. eventually developed can a, a cancer of the it's the in the the, this is the gland that produces the saliva gland in the face. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine it, that? It's reminding me of a um, an unusual case I know of, which reminds me one other thing I want to say about fertility. Uh, was I uh, knew a gentleman who was responsible for creating the genius software program that homeopaths use. So the other thing I have in my repertory of tricks is that I'm a classical homeopath. Oh, and uh, I, 
a patient comes to me for nutrition, I can't help but think homeopathy. A patient comes for homeopathy, I just have to ask them, you know, what they eat and and make some suggestions that way. But you know, uh, so this gentleman who did a lot of programming did this wonderful homeopathic program. Spent you know hours with his uh, laptop on his lap. Got a melanoma of the rectum. Oof. Uh, which was fatal and um you know that is just that's just right there yes Ooh, that's that. a very rare location for melanoma and very to where someone sitting with a laptop where the radiation would go wow so uh i'm pretty convinced you know uh, i house a couple of years ago has a microwave in it so we make we joke because Every once in a while, we really do, but we turn it on and, and walk, get out of the room as fast as we can. That's something I really wish had a remote uh, because, you know, all those microwaves leak. Yes. Well, that's a great a concept, the a remote for the microwave. That could be a, that could be very, that's, I've never thought of that. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Because I, you know, I push it from the side and run out of the room. Yeah, yeah, that's, oh, I'm, I'm with you. I used to do the same thing, and finally we've just switched over to a convection. We've got this kind of convection oven thing, that old small one on the countertop that, uh, um, that uh, works pretty well. And uh, I've seen those. Those are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Wow, this is, a, well, I, well let's, let's just touch on one other thing, if we could. Um, we, we, have talked about, a, we have we, about two more minutes. Yeah, okay. We, well, let's tell you what, we should, I think we'll need to leave the other questions for another time. Uh, Sounds good. Just to wrap up, what I liked, maybe we could, to, to leave people with a few action steps for people that want to, uh, you know, that want to listen to this and take away two or, just two or three bullet points um, to improve their health and vitality, uh, what would be the top two or three things that you've, you see or the small hinges that swing big doors? Oh, the small hinge of that. What a great uh, image. I love that. Uh, I, I think I invite people to consider that their life really is more like a playground than a um, factory job. And that if they health, their health is not optimal, <clears throat> throw all the pieces up and see if they can come down differently. And my suggestion for people who are not feeling well would always be to take the foods out of their diet that known to be the most irritating in most people, and that would be grains and legumes and dairy, um, and to take out the elements of their life that are the, known to be the most damaging, stress and lack of sleep and lack of exercise, and just decide, uh, not that, oh, I can do this, this sounds too hard, but of course I can do this. I've done, my, you know, anyone who's had a baby, Anyone who's family, anyone who's got a college degree has done things a lot more difficult than going off grains for six weeks. Yes. Uh, and your health is in your hands, and it's up to you to step back and look and say, well, I'm going to move around some of these variables because, uh, and you know, and I, I think I see a lot of people, particularly as they get older, say, well, that's all right. I'll just take this drug for that and that drug for this and and maybe a couple drugs for this other problem, and, and I'll just keep rolling on, because really I'm okay. And when you have high blood pressure, it isn't that you have a deficiency of a tenolol. It's that you have something really amiss with your whole physiology. And if you fix that whole thing, you'll be able to get off your blood pressure drug as kind of a side effect of it. But many other things down the road won't pop up as the other heads of the hydra that you thought you caught off when you just took the atenolol for your blood pressure. So think of your body and your life with it in a playful, optimistic, can-do sort of way and uh, juggle some things if you're not happy with your life. Oh, I love it. I love the tips. And please consider doing a book for everybody out there. You've got some great <laughs> wisdom and uh, you know, a great mind and great experience to, to back it up. And uh, so, Dr. Deborah Gordon, thank you so much uh, for coming on our show. We'll, uh, we'll be in contact. This will be going up on YouTube before Christmas, and then we'll be going up. We're launching on iTunes uh, in mid, mid or late January. I look forward to seeing you, your face in many more interviews. You're a great interviewer. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And you a great, have a great And a great day. weekend. And holiday season. Fantastic. Same here. So... Thank you again. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.